Hello, everybody, and welcome to session number two of From the Ground Up, Western Cover Crop Council's Pacific Northwest Subregional Conference Series. My name is Stephen Hines with the University of Idaho Extension, and I'll be your moderator today. Today, our session topics are going to discuss current cover crop projects in vegetable production. And so to get us started today, I would like to introduce Jeff Smink. He is with the Palmer, Alaska Soil and Water Conservation District and he's going to visit with you about using cover crops in Alaska vegetable production systems. Jeff, welcome. Good morning, or lunchtime for many of you. Thanks for the invitation to come to talk at the webinar. As mentioned, I'm an agronomist with the Palmer Soil and Water Conservation District. From many of you looking at maps, Alaska is not an island next to Hawaii off the coast of California. Alaska is actually fairly good sized and a good portion of the state is above the Arctic Circle. From Fairbanks, it's about 100 miles up to the Arctic Circle. So there are the there are the maps. You can see uh, where Alaska truly is and the size of it compared to the continental United States, and where the Arctic Circle is compared to Fairbanks. There are three major agricultural regions of Alaska. Interior Alaska is characterized by warm summers, long day lengths. So Fairbanks has 21 hours of sun in the sky during June. I live in South Central where we have a maritime climate, so cooler summers, and we have almost 20 hours of daylight. And Kenai Peninsula is part of South Central, but you can see as they go further south, Homer has only 18 and a half hours of sunlight in the summertime. The challenges to Alaska farmer acceptance of cover crops, one of our really big ones is land is extremely expensive. So farmers are reluctant to not have it busy. Where I live, vegetable land is $25,000 an acre, and that's primarily from development pressure. As you get further away from Anchorage, the cleared land is maybe a $1,000 purchase price, but then there's an additional $8,000 clearing expense to make it productive. And everybody knows of all the land in Alaska, well, much of that is remote land. So the land is inexpensive, but the access is only by boat or by plane. You can see in the map below, beyond the road system that are on the maps, there are no roads to get to that land. So if you're going to farm out in those remote areas, you're going to be barging or flying your equipment in. Another really large challenge to us is our short growing season. So there are only a few opportunities to double crop. Uh, the soil thaws in early May here in South Central and around uh, late May for the interior Alaska. And we have a killing frost in South Central in middle of September and in interior, they would have a killing frost in late August. So you can see how short our growing season is. But when you look at the temperature in South Central, 70 degrees is a hot day. And in the interior, 80 degrees is a hot day. So we have a very short period on the calendar, but with our day length, we actually have a decent growing season. When the sun is in the sky for 20 hours a day, you have few days, but they're long and productive. Another challenge to um, cover cropping is the practice is very new to Alaska, so we don't have much information. We found that the crop calculators that we can find from the various companies, they don't work so well for our unique season. They're not geared up for such cool weather or so for so much long day length. We don't have any documentation on the health benefits from the soil, so we don't have nice data to show to the farmers. And we also have no success stories to convince other growers of how well it works. So basically, growers don't know if it's a profitable, press, profitable practice here in Alaska. A third challenge, or fourth challenge is equipment, the chicken and egg issue. Nobody does it here. So there's no market for cover cropping equipment or no service to put cover crops on. And because there's no equipment to make it easy, nobody uses cover crop. So trying to break this chicken and egg issue, I'm fabricating up an air seeder for my little specialty tractor. And I'm gonna see if the conservation district can provide a service for custom cover crop seeding. A number of growers have also come up with some IPM concerns because the cool season vegetables are so prominent in Alaska, we're very reluctant to put brassica cover crops into the rotation just from a disease management standpoint. 
uh, from weed issues, we don't have too many herbicides registered for Alaska vegetables. So farmers are very concerned about weed control. They're worried about the potential to import seeds to Alaska in this cover crop mixes. And they're also worried about the seed bank going to seed among the cover crop. And the third one, the, another choice is we've had some bad issues where former uh, forage crops have become weeds. Bird vetch and sweet clover were still fighting all over the state. The picture shows a copy of uh, a potato field. When I worked in Michigan, we were looking at using chickweed as a cover crop because it's easy to kill and it grows under the snow almost. It's very good for late, the shoulder seasons with the winter. When I got to Alaska, I found we had mutant chickweed. This chickweed just took over the entire potato patch. So we have to be careful about what we're using as cover crops here. We've had a couple of projects to promote cover crop use. When I worked for the university, we were looking at, can we use cover crops to influence aphid populations because aphids are the big disease transmitters in potatoes. So we banded oats, an aphid attractant, and we banded canola, an aphid repellent, just to see if we could change the aphid numbers. Well, Alaska has such few aphids, there weren't any statistical differences. And we learned that if you put oats in between potatoes, the roots grow into the hills and the potato harvesting equipment can't separate out the potatoes because it's one big sod coming through the machines. We currently have a soil health, uh, health initiative with the Alaska Plant Materials Center and it's sponsored by the NRCS. There are 12 different treatments, a timothy, alfalfa, oat pea, oat pea buckwheat radish, and oat pea buckwheat radish rye alfalfa mixes. When we have one, two, and three years of the rotation, and then after the sequence has come through, they put in potatoes. And the question is, is the rotation influencing soil health measures and is the rotation influencing the potato yield? So far, we've been seeing some promising results that we can change some of the soil health parameters within two years. And there are some hints that the potato production has also increased. NRCS sponsored the conservation district to put in a date of seeding trial. So every Monday from Memorial Day to mid-September, we seeded the same oat pea radish mix that the Plant Material Center was using. And then we wanted to see what was our rate of growth. So we looked at what, just before frost termination, we looked at crop height, biomass, percent cover, bulk density, infiltration, and the nutrient status. And the important thing we found was all we needed was about four or five weeks of growth before the killing frost to get enough ground cover to protect against erosion. So here's a picture of six weeks before freezing. So we went into winter with a fairly good amount of cover. And on the right side of the picture, we could see how much residue was left over at the end of the growing uh, end of the winter. And the farmer said his tractor hardly noticed it when he tilled it up for potatoes that following year. So he was very happy with it. A current project we've got going sponsored by SARE is we're using crimped cover crops for weed suppression in transplanted vegetables. We've got 10 species of cover crops and then three locations. And then we crimp the plots just before frost and making sure that the seeds didn't mature. The residue is left in place. And then next spring, we will transplant lettuce into the, into the residue and then see, do we have a smothering effect from all the residue? Basically, will our labor charges be less because of weed smothering from the residue or will our labor be less in the rototilled control plots next to it? Uh, just playing around, we have a low soil. So in the upper right hand picture, you can see the wind howling along our riverbed, how it's blowing all that river silt around. Just on the other side of the trees in that picture is the field on the far left of it. So that's all a low soil and the farmer is very worried about his soil blowing away also. So he called me the day after Memorial Day, or excuse me, day after Labor Day and said, I'm going to be incorporating all my vegetables for disease management. Do you wanna go in and play with some cover crops? 
So I threw in uh, various rates of OP mixture and we had three weeks before the killing freeze came in. The peas didn't do anything, but you can see there was some nice green strips in the springtime. So we had just from that quick throwing out seed right on top of the standing crop in front of the rototiller, the seed got incorporated and we had pretty good ground cover in some of the plots. In the bottom right picture, you can see what happens with no protection, that silt with no structure, the spring thaw just moves it around the fields, giving us rills. And in some fields, we'll get gullying. A big project that's planned for this coming season is uh, sponsored by the NRCS. It uses the Plant Material Center and six of the conservation districts. We're going to put in 23 species at each location along a 600 mile transect from Homer to Fairbanks. The red triangles will be planting early around Memorial Day and the two yellow triangles will be planting in middle of May just to catch what's our crop production from our late season cover crop. And then we'll collect the biomass percent cover production data and we'll use the protocols that the other states are using just so we can all compare results with each other. So each location will plant at the appropriate date for their location. So even though Fairbanks and Kenai are planting early around Memorial Day, Kenai will probably plant in the end of May where Fairbanks will probably plant the first week or so into uh, June because their soil is just so much colder. Uh, everybody has different equipment. So three sites have drills that they'll use. Two of them are no-tills and one is a conventional drill. And the five sites that don't have drills will find different ways of broadcasting the seed and then incorporating it. And then our end goal is that we can make an Alaska appropriate cover crop calculator. And we think the implications go well beyond agriculture because we have wildfires and that soil is so damaged that if we can get a cover crop to stabilize it, that would really help our erosion issues. Uh, mine reclamation, how do we hold the soil in place before the true revegetation can take place? Swept soil stabilizations and all kinds of DOT projects. Further ideas for cover crops, everybody's interested in which species or which species mix will best build organic matter in our conditions and which ones will minimize erosion. For weed control, we want to determine which species or mix of species will smother the weeds. Our organic growers are so concerned about weed control and our conventional ones are also. For the conventional growers having the option, are there possibilities to use herbicide tolerant crops as cover crops? If they use Roundup Ready soybeans or sugar beets, they can go in and spray right over top of the cover crop to control all the background weeds that they're so concerned about. And some of the growers are taking it to the next level. They wanna see, are there alleopathic cover crops or suppressive cover crops to hold back plant diseases as the crops break down? A big issue for us too is logistics. How do we incorporate cover crops into our cropping systems? Where are the windows that we can put it in and then Physically, how do we develop the scale appropriate equipment to mechanize the cover crops? How do we not make it all hand seeding and hand harvesting? So thanks very much for the chance to update you on Alaska conditions. Uh, very interesting learning about agriculture in Alaska. All right, thanks, Jeff.